Pharmacovigilance, Wikipedia article audio. Pharmacovigilance, also known as drug safety, is the pharmacological science relating to the collection, detection, assessment, monitoring, and prevention of adverse effects with pharmaceutical products. The etymological roots for the word pharmacovigilance are, pharmacon and vigilare. As such, pharmacovigilance heavily focuses on adverse drug reactions, or ADRs, which are defined as any response to a drug which is noxious and unintended, including lack of efficacy. Medication errors such as overdose and misuse and abuse of a drug as well as drug exposure during pregnancy and breastfeeding, are also of interest, even without an adverse event, because they may result in an adverse drug reaction. Terms commonly used in drug safety Information received from patients and healthcare providers via pharmacovigilance agreements, as well as other sources such as the medical literature, plays a critical role in providing the data necessary for pharmacovigilance to take place. In fact, in order to market or to test a pharmaceutical product in most countries, adverse event data received by the license holder must be submitted to the local drug regulatory authority. Ultimately, Pharmacovigilance is concerned with identifying the hazards associated with pharmaceutical products and with minimizing the risk of any harm that may come to patients. Companies must conduct a comprehensive drug safety and pharmacovigilance audit to assess their compliance with worldwide laws, regulations, and guidance. Adverse Event Reporting Pharmacovigilance has its own unique terminology that is important to understand. Most of the following terms are used within this article and are peculiar to drug safety, although some are used by other disciplines within the pharmaceutical sciences as well. Individual Case Safety Report The activity that is most commonly associated with pharmacovigilance and which consumes a significant amount of resources for drug regulatory authorities and drug safety departments in pharmaceutical companies, is that of adverse event reporting. Adverse event reporting involves the receipt, triage, data entering, assessment, distribution, reporting, and archiving of AE data and documentation. The source of AE reports may include spontaneous reports from healthcare professionals or patients, solicited reports from patient support programs, reports from clinical or post-marketing studies, reports from literature sources, reports from the media, and reports reported to drug regulatory authorities themselves. For pharmaceutical companies, AE reporting is a regulatory requirement in most countries. AE reporting also provides data to these companies and drug regulatory authorities that play a key role in assessing the risk-benefit profile of a given drug. The following are several facets of AE reporting. Coding of adverse events One of the fundamental principles of adverse event reporting is the determination of what constitutes an individual case safety report. During the triage phase of a potential adverse event report, it is important to determine if the four elements of a valid ICSR are present, an identifiable patient, an identifiable reporter, a suspect drug, and an adverse event. Seriousness Determination If one or more of these four elements is missing, the case is not a valid ICSR. Although there are no exceptions to this rule there may be circumstances that may require a judgment call. For example, the term identifiable may not always be clear-cut. If a physician reports that he slash she has a patient X taking drug Y who experienced Z, but refuses to provide any specifics about patient X, the report is still a valid case even though the patient is not specifically identified. 
This is because the reporter has first-hand information about the patient and is identifiable to the physician. Identifiability is important so as not only to prevent duplicate reporting of the same case, but also to permit follow-up for additional information. Expedited Reporting The concept of identifiability also applies to the other three elements. Although uncommon, it is not unheard of for fictitious adverse event cases to be reported to a company by an anonymous individual trying to damage the company's reputation or a company's product. In these and all other situations, the source of the report should be ascertained. But anonymous reporting is also important, as whistleblower protection is not granted in all countries. In general, the drug must also be specifically named. Note that in different countries and regions of the world, drugs are sold under various trade names. In addition, there are a large number of generics which may be mistaken for the trade product. Finally, there is the problem of counterfeit drugs producing adverse events. If at all possible, it is best to try to obtain the sample which induced the adverse event, and send it to either the EMA, FDA, or other government agency responsible for investigating AE reports. If a reporter can't recall the name of the drug they were taking when they experienced an adverse event, this would not be a valid case. This concept also applies to adverse events. If a patient states that they experienced symptoms, but cannot be more specific, such a report might technically be considered valid, but will be of very limited value to the pharmacovigilance department of the company or to drug regulatory authorities. Clinical Trial Reporting Spontaneous Reporting Aggregate Reporting Other Reporting Methods Adverse event coding is the process by which information from an AE reporter, called the verbatim, is coded using standardized terminology from a medical coding dictionary, such as MedDRA. The purpose of medical coding is to convert adverse event information into terminology that can be readily identified and analyzed. For instance, patient may first report that they had experienced a very bad headache that felt like their head was being hit by a hammer when taking drug X. Or, patient may second report that they had experienced a slight, throbbing headache that occurred daily at about 2 in the afternoon while taking drug Y. Neither verbatim 1 nor verbatim 2 will exactly match a code in the MedDRA coding dictionary. However, both quotes describe different manifestations of a headache. As a result, in this example both quotes would be coded as PT headache. Although somewhat intuitive, there are a set of criteria within pharmacovigilance that are used to distinguish a serious adverse event from a non-serious one. An adverse event is considered serious if it meets one or more of the following criteria. Aside from death, each of these categories is subject to some interpretation. Life-threatening, as it used in the drug safety world, specifically refers to an adverse event that places the patient at an immediate risk of death, such as cardiac or respiratory arrest. By this definition, events such as myocardial infarction, which would be hypothetically life-threatening, would not be considered life-threatening unless the patient went into cardiac arrest following the MI. Defining what constitutes hospitalization can be problematic as well. Although typically straightforward, it's possible for a hospitalization to occur even if the events being treated are not serious. By the same token, serious events may be treated without hospitalization, such as the treatment of anaphylaxis may be successfully performed with epinephrine. Significant disability and incapacity, as a concept, is also subject to debate. 
while permanent disability following a stroke would no doubt be serious, would complete blindness for 30 seconds be considered significant disability. For birth defects, the seriousness of the event is usually not in dispute so much as the attribution of the event to the drug. Finally, medically significant events is a category that includes events that may be always serious, or sometimes serious, but will not fulfill any of the other criteria. Events such as cancer might always be considered serious, whereas liver disease, depending on its TGI grade grades 1 or 2 are generally considered non-serious and grades 3 to 5 serious may be considered non-serious. This refers to ICSRs that involve a serious and unlisted event that is considered related to the use of the drug. In most countries, the time frame for reporting expedited cases is 7 15 calendar days from the time a drug company receives notification of such a case. Within clinical trials such a case is referred to as a SUSAR. If the SUSAR involves an event that is life-threatening or fatal, it may be subject to a 7-day clock. Cases that do not involve a serious, unlisted event may be subject to non-expedited or periodic reporting. Also known as SAE reporting from clinical trials, safety information from clinical studies is used to establish a drug's safety profile in humans and is a key component that drug regulatory authorities consider in the decision-making as to whether to grant or deny market authorization for a drug. SAE reporting occurs as a result of study patients who experience serious adverse events during the conducting of clinical trials. SAE information, which may also include relevant information from the patient's medical background, are reviewed and assessed for causality by the study investigator. This information is forwarded to a sponsoring entity that is responsible for the reporting of this information as appropriate, to drug regulatory authorities. Spontaneous reports are termed spontaneous as they take place during the clinician's normal diagnostic appraisal of a patient, when the clinician is drawing the conclusion that the drug may be implicated in the causality of the event. Spontaneous reporting system relies on vigilant physicians and other healthcare professionals who not only generate a suspicion of an ADR, but also report it. It is an important source of regulatory actions such as taking a drug off the market or a label change due to safety problems. Spontaneous reporting is the core data generating system of international pharmacovigilance relying on healthcare professionals to identify and report any adverse events to their National Pharmacovigilance Center, Health Authority, or to the drug manufacturer itself. Spontaneous reports are, by definition, submitted voluntarily although under certain circumstances these reports may be encouraged, or stimulated, by media reports or articles published in medical or scientific publications, or by product lawsuits. In many parts of the world adverse event reports are submitted electronically using a defined message standard. One of the major weaknesses of spontaneous reporting is that of under-reporting, where, unlike in clinical trials, less than 100% of those adverse events occurring are reported. Further complicating the assessment of adverse events, AE reporting behavior varies greatly between countries and in relation to the seriousness of the events, but in general probably less than 10% of all adverse events that occur are actually reported. The rule of thumb is that on a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 being least likely to be reported and 10 being the most likely to be reported, an uncomplicated non-serious event such as a mild headache will be closer to A0 on this scale, whereas a life-threatening or fatal event will be closer to A10 in terms of its likelihood of being reported. In view of this, medical personnel may not always see AE reporting as a priority, 
especially if the symptoms are not serious. And even if the symptoms are serious, the symptoms may not be recognized as a possible side effect of a particular drug or combination thereof. In addition, Medical personnel may not feel compelled to report events that are viewed as expected. This is why reports from patients themselves are of high value. The confirmation of these events by a healthcare professional is typically considered to increase the value of these reports. Hence it is important not only for the patient to report the AE to his healthcare provider, but also report the AE to both the biopharmaceutical company and the FDA, EMA. This is especially important when one has obtained one's pharmaceutical from a compounding pharmacy. As such, spontaneous reports are a crucial element in the worldwide enterprise of pharmacovigilance and form the core of the World Health Organization database, which includes around 4.6 million reports growing annually by about 250,000. Aggregate reporting, also known as periodic reporting, plays a key role in the safety assessment of drugs. Aggregate reporting involves the compilation of safety data for a drug over a prolonged period of time, as opposed to single case reporting which, by definition, involves only individual AE reports. The advantage of aggregate reporting is that it provides a broader view of the safety profile of a drug. Worldwide, the most important aggregate report is the Periodic Safety Update Report and Development Safety Updated Report. This is a document that is submitted to drug regulatory agencies in Europe, the US and Japan, as well as other countries around the world. The PSUR was updated in 2012 and is now referred to in many countries as the Periodic Benefit Risk Evaluation Report. As the title suggests, the Lbrayer's focus is on the benefit risk profile of the drug, which includes a review of relevant safety data compiled for a drug product since its development. Adverse drug reaction is a side effect occurring with a drug where a positive causal relationship between the event and the drug is thought, or has been proven, to exist. Adverse event is a side effect occurring with a drug. By definition, the causal relationship between the AE and the drug is unknown, benefits are commonly expressed as the proven therapeutic good of a product but should also include the patient's subjective assessment of its effects causal relationship is said to exist when a drug is thought to have caused or contributed to the occurrence of an adverse drug reaction clinical trial refers to an organized program to determine the safety and slash or efficacy of a drug in patients the design of a clinical trial will depend on the drug and the phase of its development. Control group is a group of individual patients that is used as a standard of comparison within a clinical trial. The control group may be taking a placebo or where a different active drug is given as a comparator. D-challenge and re-challenge refer to a drug being stopped and restarted in a patient, respectively. A positive D-challenge has occurred. For example, when an adverse event abates or resolves completely following the drug's discontinuation. A positive rechallenge has occurred when the adverse event reoccurs after the drug is restarted. Dechallenge and rechallenge play an important role in determining whether a causal relationship between an event and a drug exists. Effectiveness is the extent to which a drug works under real world circumstances, i.e., Clinical practice, efficacy is the extent to which a drug works under ideal circumstances, i.e., in clinical trials, event refers to an adverse event, harm is the nature and extent of the actual damage that could be or has been caused, implied causality refers to spontaneously. Reported AE cases where the causality is always presumed to be positive unless the reporter states otherwise. Individual case safety report is an adverse event report for an individual patient, 
Life-threatening refers to an adverse event that places a patient at the immediate risk of death. Phase refers to the four phases of clinical research and development, I small safety trials early on in a drug's development, two medium-sized trials for both safety and efficacy, three large trials, which includes key trials, four large, post-marketing trials, typically for safety reasons. There are also intermediate phases designated by an A or B, e.g. phase IIB, risk is the probability of harm being caused, usually expressed as a percent or ratio of the treated population, risk factor is an attribute of a patient that may predispose, or increase the risk, of that patient developing an event that may or may not be drug-related. For instance, obesity is considered a risk factor for a number of different diseases and, potentially, ADRs. Others would be high blood pressure, diabetes, possessing a specific mutated gene, for example, mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes increase propensity to develop breast cancer. Signal is a new safety finding within safety data that requires further investigation. There are three categories of signals, confirmed signals where the data indicate that there is a causal relationship between the drug and the AE, refuted signals where after investigation the data indicate that no causal relationship exists and unconfirmed signals which require further investigation such as the conducting of a post-marketing trial to study the issue, temporal relationship is said to exist when an adverse event occurs when a patient is taking a given drug. Although a temporal relationship is absolutely necessary in order to establish a causal relationship between the drug and the AE, a temporal relationship does not necessarily in and of itself prove that the event was caused by the drug. Triage refers to the process of placing a potential adverse event report into one of three categories, one non-serious case, two serious case, or three no case. Some countries legally oblige spontaneous reporting by physicians. In most countries, manufacturers are required to submit, through its qualified person for pharmacovigilance, all of the reports they receive from healthcare providers to the national authority. Others have intensive, focused programs concentrating on new drugs, or on controversial drugs, or on the prescribing habits of groups of doctors, or involving pharmacists in reporting. All of these generate potentially useful information. Such intensive schemes, however, tend to be the exception. Risk management is the discipline within pharmacovigilance that is responsible for signal detection and the monitoring of the risk-benefit profile of drugs. Other key activities within the area of risk management are that of the compilation of risk management plans and aggregate reports such as the Periodic Safety Update Report, Periodic Benefit Risk Evaluation Report, and the Development Safety Update Report. One of the most important, and challenging, problems in pharmacovigilance is that of the determination of causality. Causality refers to the relationship of a given adverse event to a specific drug. Causality determination is often difficult because of the lack of clear-cut or reliable data. While one may assume that a positive temporal relationship might prove a positive causal relationship, this is not always the case. Indeed, a B sting AE where the AE can clearly be attributed to a specific cause is by far the exception rather than the rule. This is due to the complexity of human physiology as well as that of disease and illnesses. By this reckoning, in order to determine causality between an adverse event and a drug, one must first exclude the possibility that there were other possible causes or contributing factors. If the patient is on a number of medications, it may be the combination of these drugs which causes the AE, 
and not any one individually. There have been a number of recent high-profile cases where the AE led to the death of an individual. The individual were not overdosed with any one of the many medications they were taking, but the combination there appeared to cause the AE. Hence it is important to include in your slash one's AE report, not only the drug being reported, but also all other drugs the patient was also taking. For instance, if a patient were to start drug X and then three days later were to develop an AE, one might be tempted to attribute blame drug X. However, before that can be done, the patient's medical history would need to be reviewed to look for possible risk factors for the AE. In other words, did the AE occur with the drug or because of the drug? This is because a patient on any drug may develop or be diagnosed with a condition that could not have possibly been caused by the drug. This is especially true for diseases, such as cancer, which develop over an extended period of time, being diagnosed in a patient who has been taken a drug for a relatively short period of time. On the other hand, certain adverse events, such as blood clots, can occur with certain drugs with only short-term exposure. Nevertheless, the determination of risk factors is an important step of confirming or ruling out a causal relationship between an event and a drug. Often the only way to confirm the existence of a causal relationship of an event to a drug is to conduct an observational study where the incidence of the event in a patient population taking the drug is compared to a control group. This may be necessary to determine if the background incidence of an event is less than that found in a group taking a drug. If the incidence of an event is statistically significantly higher in the active group versus the placebo group, it is possible that a causal relationship may exist to a drug, unless other confounding factors may exist. Signal detection involves a range of techniques. The WHO defines a safety signal as reported information on a possible causal relationship between an adverse event and a drug the relationship being unknown or incompletely documented previously. Usually more than a single report is required to generate a signal, depending upon the event and quality of the information available. Data mining pharmacovigilance databases is one approach that has become increasingly popular with the availability of extensive data sources and inexpensive computing resources. The data sources may be owned by a pharmaceutical company, a drug regulatory authority, or a large health care provider. Individual case safety reports in these databases are retrieved and converted into structured format, and statistical methods are applied to calculate statistical measures of association. If the statistical measure crosses an arbitrarily set threshold, a signal is declared for a given drug associated with a given adverse event. All signals deemed worthy of investigation, require further analysis using all available data in an attempt to confirm or refute the signal. If the analysis is inconclusive, additional data may be needed such as a post-marketing observational trial. SD is an essential part of drug use and safety surveillance. Ideally, the goal of SD is to identify ADRs that were previously considered unexpected and to be able to provide guidance in the product's labeling as to how to minimize the risk of using the drug in a given patient population. A risk management plan is a documented plan that describes the risks associated with the use of a drug and how they are being handled. The overall goal of an RMP is to assure a positive risk-benefit profile once the drug is marketed. The document is required to be submitted, in a specified format, with all new market authorization requests within the European Union. Although not necessarily required, RMPs may also be submitted in countries outside the EU. 
The risks described in an RMP fall into one of three categories, identified risks, potential risks, and unknown risks. Also described within an RMP are the measures that the market authorization holder, usually a pharmaceutical company, will undertake to minimize the risks associated with the use of the drug. These measures are usually focused on the products labeling and healthcare professionals. Indeed, the risks that are documented in a pre-authorization RMP will inevitably become part of the product's post-marketing labeling. Since a drug, once authorized, may be used in ways not originally studied in clinical trials, this potential off-label use, and its associated risks, is also described within the RMP. RMPs can be very lengthy documents, running in some cases hundreds of pages and, in rare instances, up to a thousand pages long. In the U.S., under certain circumstances, the FDA may require a company to submit a document called a Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies for a drug that has a specific risk that FDA believes requires mitigation. While not as comprehensive as an RMP, a REMS can require a sponsor to perform certain activities or to follow a protocol, referred to as elements to assure safe use to assure that a positive risk-benefit profile for the drug is maintained for the circumstances under which the product is marketed. Pharmaceutical companies are required by law in most countries to perform clinical trials, testing new drugs on people before they are made generally available. This occurs after a drug has been pre-screened for toxicity, sometimes using animals for testing. The manufacturers or their agents usually select a representative sample of patients for whom the drug is designed at most a few thousand along with a comparable control group. The control group may receive a placebo and slash or another drug, often a so-called gold standard that is best drug marketed for the disease. The purpose of clinical trials is to determine. Clinical trials do in general, tell a good deal about how well a drug works. They provide information that should be reliable for larger populations with the same characteristics as the trial group age, gender, state of health, ethnic origin, and so on though target clinical populations are typically very different from trial populations with respect to such characteristics. The variables in a clinical trial are specified and controlled, but a clinical trial can never tell you the whole story of the effects of a drug in all situations. In fact, nothing could tell you the whole story, but a clinical trial must tell you enough, enough being determined by legislation and by contemporary judgments about the acceptable balance of benefit and harm. Ultimately, when a drug is marketed it may be used in patient populations that were not studied during clinical trials and a different set of warnings, precautions, or contraindications for the product's labeling may be necessary in order to maintain a positive risk-slash-benefit profile in all known populations using the drug. Risk Management Pharmacoepidemiology is the study of the incidence of adverse drug reactions in patient populations using drug agents. Although often used interchangeably, there are subtle differences between the two disciplines. Pharmacogenetics is generally regarded as the study or clinical testing of genetic variation that gives rise to differing responses to drugs, including adverse drug reactions. It is hoped that pharmacogenetics will eventually provide information as to which genetic profiles in patients will place those patients at greatest risk, or provide the greatest benefit, for using a particular drug or drugs. Pharmacogenomics, on the other hand, is the broader application of genomic technologies to new drug discovery and further characterization of older drugs. 
The following organizations play a key collaborative role in the global oversight of pharmacovigilance. The principle of international collaboration in the field of pharmacovigilance is the basis for the WHO program for international drug monitoring, through which over 150 member nations have systems in place that encourage healthcare personnel to record and report adverse effects of drugs in their patients. These reports are assessed locally and may lead to action within the country. Since 1978, the program has been managed by the Uppsala Monitoring Center to which member countries send their reports to be processed, evaluated, and entered into an international database called Vigibase. Membership in the WHO program enables a country to know if similar reports are being made elsewhere. When there are several reports of adverse reactions to a particular drug, this process may lead to the detection of a signal, and an alert about a possible hazard communicated to members' countries after detailed evaluation and expert review. The ITCH is a global organization with members from the European Union, the United States and Japan. Its goal is to recommend global standards for drug companies and drug regulatory authorities around the world, with the ITCH Steering Committee overseeing harmonization activities. Established in 1990, each of its six CO sponsors the EU, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, the Japanese Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America have two seats on the SC. Other parties have a significant interest in itch and have been invited to nominate observers to the SC. Three current observers are the WHO, Health Canada, and the European Free Trade Association with the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association participating as a non-voting member of the SC. The SIAMS, a part of the WHO, is a globally oriented think tank that provides guidance on drug safety related topics through its working groups. The SIAMS prepares reports that are used as a reference for developing future drug regulatory policy and procedures and over the years, many of SIAM's proposed policies have been adopted. Examples of topics these reports have covered include, current challenges in pharmacovigilance, pragmatic approaches, management of safety information from clinical trials, the development safety update report, harmonizing the format and content for periodic safety reporting during clinical trials, and practical aspects of signal detection in pharmacovigilance, report of SIAMS Working Group. The ISOP is an international non-profit scientific organization, which aims to foster pharmacovigilance both scientifically and educationally, and enhance all aspects of the safe and proper use of medicines, in all countries. It was established in 1992 as the European Society of Pharmacovigilance. Causality Assessment Drug regulatory authorities play a key role in national or regional oversight of pharmacovigilance. Some of the agencies involved are listed below. Signal Detection Risk Management Plans if a drug works and how well it works, if it has any harmful effects, and, if it does more good than harm, and how much more. If it has a potential for harm, how probable and how serious is the harm. Increasing, generally, the availability of environmental data on medicinal products, Tracking emerging data on environmental exposure, effects, and risks after product launch. Using environmental risk management plans to manage risk throughout a drug's life cycle. Following risk identification. Promoting further research and environmental monitoring. And, in general, promoting a global perspective on EPV issues. 
Risk slash benefit profile of drugs. Pharmacoepidemiology. Pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. In the U.S., with about a third of all global 2011 pharmaceutical expenditures, the drug industry is regulated by the FDA, the largest national drug regulatory authority in the world. FDA authority is exercised through enforcement of regulations derived from legislation, as published in the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations. The principal drug safety regulations are found in 21 CFR Part 312 and 21 CFR Part 314. While those regulatory efforts address pre-marketing concerns, pharmaceutical manufacturers and academic-slash-non-profit organizations such as Radar and Public Citizen do play a role in pharmacovigilance in the U.S. The post-legislative rulemaking process of the U.S. federal government provides for significant input from both the legislative and executive branches, which also play specific, distinct roles in determining FDA policy. International Collaboration The far-merging, or emerging pharmaceutical market economies, which include Brazil, India, Russia, Argentina, Egypt, Indonesia, Mexico, Pakistan, Poland, Romania, South Africa, Thailand, Turkey, Ukraine, Venezuela, and Vietnam, accrued one-fifth of global 2011 pharmaceutical expenditures. In future, aggregated data for this set will include China as well. China's economy is anticipated to pass Japan to become second in the ranking of individual countries in pharmaceutical purchases by 2015, and so its PV regulation will become increasing important. China's regulation of PV is through its National Center for Adverse Drug Reaction Monitoring, under China's Ministry of Health. The World Health Organization as J. E. Sackman notes, as of April 2013 there is no Latin American equivalent of the European Medicines Agency no common body with the power to facilitate greater consistency across countries. For simplicity, and per sources, 17 smaller economies are discussed alongside the four farm emerging large economies of Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and Venezuela Bolivia. Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Suriname, and Uruguay. As of June 2012, 16 of this total of 21 countries have systems for immediate reporting and 9 have systems for periodic reporting of adverse events for on-market agents, while 10 and 8, respectively, have systems for immediate and periodic reporting of adverse events during clinical trials, most of these have PV requirements that rank as high or medium, in line with international standards. The WHO's Pan American Network for Drug Regulatory Harmonization seeks to assist Latin American countries in develop harmonized PV regulations. Some further PV regulatory examples from the far merging nations are as follows. In India, the PV Regulatory Authority is the Indian Pharmacopoeia Commission, with the National Coordination Centre under the Pharmacovigilance Programme of India in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Scientists working on pharmacovigilance share their experiences, findings, innovative ideas and researches during the annual meeting of Society of Pharmacovigilance, India. In Egypt, PV is regulated by the Egyptian Pharmacovigilance Center of the Egyptian Ministry of Health. The International Council for Harmonization the EU5 accrued 17% of global 2011 pharmaceutical expenditures. P5 
PV efforts in the EU are coordinated by the European Medicines Agency and are conducted by the national competent authorities. The main responsibility of the EMA is to maintain and develop the pharmacovigilance database consisting of all suspected serious adverse reactions to medicines observed in the European community. The data processing network and management system is called Eudrovigilance and contains separate but similar databases of human and veterinary reactions. The EMA requires the individual marketing authorization holders to submit all received adverse reactions in electronic form, except in exceptional circumstances. The reporting obligations of the various stakeholders are defined by EEC legislation, namely Regulation No. 726-2004, and for human medicines, European Union Directive 2001-83-EC as amended and Directive 2001-20-EC. In 2002, Heads of medicines agencies agreed on a mandate for an ad hoc working group on establishing a European risk management strategy. The working group considered the conduct of a high level survey of EU pharmacovigilance resources to promote the utilization of expertise and encourage collaborative working. In conjunction with this oversight, Individual countries maintain their distinct regulatory agencies with PV responsibility. For instance, in Spain, PV is regulated by the Agencia Española de Medicamentos y Productos Sanitarios, a legal entity that retains the right to suspend or withdraw the authorization of pharmaceuticals already on market if the evidence shows that safety of an agent are unsatisfactory. The Council for International Organizations of Medical Science the remaining EU and non-EU countries outside the EU5 accrued 7% of global 2011 pharmaceutical expenditures. Regulation of those outside the EU being managed by specific governmental agencies. For instance, in Switzerland, PV inspections for clinical trials of medicinal products are conducted by the Swiss Agency for Therapeutic Products. In Japan, with 12% of all global 2011 pharmaceutical expenditures, PV matters are regulated by the Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices Agency and the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare MHLW. The International Society of Pharmacovigilance In Canada, with 2% of all global 2011 pharmaceutical expenditures, PV is regulated by the Marketed Health Products Directorate of the Health Products and Food Branch. The Republic of Korea, with 1% of all global 2011 pharmaceutical expenditures, PV matters are regulated in South Korea by the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety and the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare MHLW. Regulatory Authorities in Kenya, PV is regulated by the Pharmacy and Poisons Board. The Pharmacy and Poisons Board provides a pharmacovigilance electronic reporting system which allows for the online reporting of suspected adverse drug reactions as well as suspected poor quality of medicinal products. The pharmacovigilance activities in Kenya are supported by the School of Pharmacy. University of Nairobi through its Master of Pharmacy in Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacovigilance program offered by the Department of Pharmacology and Pharmacognosy. In Uganda, PV is regulated by the National Drug Authority. RO accrued 7% of global 2011 pharmaceutical expenditures. Some examples of PV regulatory agencies in RO are as follows. In Iraq, PV is regulated by the Iraqi Pharmacovigilance Center of the Iraqi Ministry of Health. United States Despite attention from the FDA and regulatory agencies of the European Union, procedures for monitoring drug concentrations and adverse effects in the environment are lacking. 
pharmaceuticals, their metabolites, and related substances may enter the environment after patient excretion, after direct release to waste streams during manufacturing or administration, or via terrestrial deposits. A concept combining pharmacovigilance and environmental pharmacology, intended to focus attention on this area, was introduced first as ecopharmacology and later as ecopharmacovigilance by Velo ETAL, with further concurrent and later terms for the same concept. Emerging Economies The first of these routes to the environment, elimination through living organisms subsequent to pharmacotherapy, is suggested as the principal source of environmental contamination, and EPV is intended to deal specifically with this impact of pharmacological agents on the environment. Activities of EPV have been suggested to include European Union A medical device is an instrument, apparatus, implant, in vitro reagent, or similar or related article that is used to diagnose, prevent, or treat disease or other conditions, and does not achieve its purposes through chemical action within or on the body. Whereas medicinal products achieve their principal action by pharmacological, metabolic, or immunological means, medical devices act by physical, mechanical, or thermal means. Medical devices vary greatly in complexity and application. Examples range from simple devices such as tongue depressors, medical thermometers, and disposable gloves to advanced devices such as medical robots, cardiac pacemakers, and neuroprosthetics. Given the inherent difference between medicinal products and medical products, the vigilance of medical devices is also different from that of medicinal products. To reflect this difference, a classification system has been adopted in some countries to stratify the risk of failure with the different classes of devices. The classes of devices typically run on a 1 to 3 or 1 to 4 scale, with class 1 being the least likely to cause significant harm with device failure versus classes 3 or 4 being the most likely to cause significant harm with device failure. An example of a device in the low-risk category would be contact lenses. An example of a device in the high-risk category would be cardiac pacemakers. Medical Device Reporting which is the reporting of adverse events with medical devices, is similar to that with medicinal products, although there are differences. For instance, in the U.S. user facilities such as hospitals and nursing homes are legally required to report suspected medical device-related deaths to both FDA and the manufacturer, if known, and serious injuries to the manufacturer or to FDA if the manufacturer is unknown. This is in contrast to the voluntary reporting of ease with medicinal products. The safety of herbal medicines has become a major concern to both national health authorities and the general public. The use of herbs as traditional medicines continues to expand rapidly across the world. Many people now take herbal medicines or herbal products for their health care in different national health care settings. However, mass media reports of adverse events with herbal medicines can be incomplete and therefore misleading. Moreover, it can be difficult to identify the causes of herbal medicine-associated adverse events since the amount of data on each event is generally less than for pharmaceuticals formally regulated as drugs. Rest of Europe, including non-EU Japan Canada South Korea Africa Kenya Rest of world Echopharmacovigilance Related to medical devices For herbal medicines Industry associations